Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Truly, it is again of time to come together to praise and worship the Lord and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, in whom I am well pleased. Amen. Truly, it is a great day. The sun is shining. It's not raining. We just give God all the glory and all the praise. Amen. We thank God for our pastor this morning who's with us again today. We just give honor to him. And to all of you in our presence this morning at Gardner Grove Baptist Church, we truly thank God for his mercy and his grace. Let us go in to prayer at this moment and just invoke God's presence here this morning. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we truly thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for waking us up one more day. You watched over us, Lord God, ever, ever since last night. You woke us up this morning in our right minds able to address ourselves and come out to the house of the Lord. We just give you honor and glory, Father God. We pray, O oh God, that you would touch the one that's going to facilitate our lesson this morning, Father God, coming from you. Father God, we want to be able to look at your word this morning and, and use it, Father God, to grow, Father God. We see the importance of your temple being rebuilt, Father God, for your people. We pray, O oh God, that you would just bless the man this morning that's going to to facilitate our lesson. We pray that you'd bless us all the days coming, Father. In the mighty name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. It is again it is my privilege to introduce to some of you that already know uh, Brother Sanford. Uh, to those that don't know him, he is a man of God. He has, been, he has surrendered himself to the Lord. Amen. And we thank him this morning for just taking time out to just bring us the word in our Sunday school lesson this morning. I introduce to you again the brother Lee Sanford. Amen. 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 Good morning, Gardner Grove, and all who worship with us today. Amen. It is really a blessed day to be in service of God. Got a beautiful sunny day out, and we are ready to study his word this morning. Amen. Today's lesson is the celebration of completion. Completion. It comes from Ezra, the sixth chapter, the 13th through the 22nd verse. And when you complete something, there's a sense of liberation that you've accomplished something. Mm -hmm. And we know that God completed something when he freed us, when he redeemed mm -hmm. us. And in Hebrew times, they would celebrate the Passover every year in celebration of what God had done for them. And in today's modern times, we celebrate the Lord's Supper mm -hmm. the same way because he has made us complete. That's the point of today's lesson. And so we're going to move forward into the first outline. Revision from previous opponents. Revision from previous opponents. And this outline, I call it finish the work. Because the work had started already. And I'm talking about the exiles and returning them to the homeland. And they had a lot of things to do. Uh, they came back in phases, waves, three or four waves. And one wave, in particular in today's lesson, they had to finish the temple. They had to finish the temple. And another one, we remember Nehemiah had to finish the wall. There's a whole lot of stuff had to be done in order to repatriate them. And so verse 13 reads, then Tatnay, governor of this side of the river, Shedabozne, and their companions according to that which Darius the king had sent, so they did speedily. If you remember, God had touched Darius, who was a pagan king. Darius didn't know God. He was a pagan king, but he had touched him to uh, decree and provide resources for the children of Israel to return to their homeland. And these resources consisted of the funds, money. You can't get anything done without funds. Uh, animals, okay, to sustain them, and grain. 
to help feed them. And so they were charged to do this and do it. I like that last word, speedily, because things had drug out a little bit as we are prone to do when we are human. But Darius looked and, did, and said, oh, it's not going like it should go. And so he intervened himself. 14, and the elders of the Jews built, and they prospered through the prophesying of Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the son of Iddo. And they built and finished it according to the commandments of the Lord God of Israel and according to the commandments of Cyrus and Darius and Artaxerxes, king of Persia. I found that verse interesting because you see three different kings, monarchs, who considered themselves gods themselves back in those days. And each of them, God had reached out and touched to say, let them return. They had been in exile a long time and help them to rebuild what was lost. And so this is Darius the king we're talking about today. And this house was finished on the third day of the month, Adar, which was the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. And I found it interesting when the temple was finished, it was exactly 72 years after they had been taken into exile. And you know, it had been prophesied that they would be in exile for 70 years. And I found that prophetic in a way because that meant that a whole generation had passed, maybe two generations, okay? And God did that for a purpose, and it is not ours to try to question why. Like he kept them in the wilderness for 40 years so that a generation would pass on. But his will is always perfect. And so the resistors, there are always the naysayers, even today in the church, we have naysayers. The resistors, Darius just told them, stop it. Be quiet and do what I said. Now, second outline, restoration to passionate worship. In the second outline, they had finished the work, but they had to dedicate the temple, which is just as important. When you move into a new sanctuary, even a new home, you need God's presence yes. in that place. Yes. And that's what the dedication does. Verse 16 reads, And the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the children of the captivity kept the dedication of this house of God with joy. And that's a key word. Sometimes we are too much of a sourpuss. You know, we, we look at everything negatively. And we should you say, enter his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. And so we should be joyful when things like this happen in our lives and offered at the dedication of this house of God, look at this, a hundred bullocks, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and for a sin offering for all Israel. 12 he goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. Now, in the Old Testament, you had a series of offerings that were done. You had a burnt offering. You had a peace offering. And he's talking here about the sin offering. That's the, uh, the, the he goats that were placed there. Because we had to do some type of recompense for the sins that we were guilty of. And that was how God had established back many years before that it was to be accomplished under the Old Testament scriptures. Now don't get confused because now we're under the New Testament. Jesus did it all. Jesus did it all. I repeat that. And they set the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their courses for the service of God, which is at Jerusalem as it is written in the book of Moses. The writer in today's lesson reminds us that everything was done according to the way it was set forth 
back during Moses' time when God gave Moses the law that we live under. And you know the first five books of the Bible are the books of Moses, or they call them the Pentateuch, because they set forth all the laws that we should live under. And so what the writer was saying, the people had to learn and not miss the importance of worship. And that's what we are somewhat struggling with today, with COVID out there rampant, and we are going into the third year now. But worship is important. It's important to us as Christians and believers in God. And we are corporate worship. Well, we can worship at home, and we do. But corporate worship is important. That's why the scripture says, forsake not to assemble yourself. We have to come up and strengthen, come out and strengthen each other. When I come out here, I get strength from each of you, and you should draw strength from me. And that number, the sin offering with the 12 he goats, you know, the number 12 is uh, the number of perfection of government rule. And God had touched what I said, the government to intervene and make sure that everything was going to be done. So we move to the third outline, resuming participation in the Passover. When the children came back, they had lost the law, and they had stopped doing all the things that God had told them to do. But God is a fixer. He fixed them. He'll fix us. He'll fix you if you have something going on in your life. 19, and the children of the captivity kept the Passover upon the 14th day of the first month. And that Passover was indicative of God's salvation because he had saved his people. We as black people should know something about that because we went through 400 years of slavery also. And God brought us out of that. For the priests and the Levites were purified together. All of them were pure and killed the Passover for all the children of the captivity and for the brethren and the priest and for themselves. You notice when you're ready to worship God and dedicate something to God, it's a process. And that was the purification part. You can't just come as you are. You got to clean up some. That's why uh, folks used to say, uh, they used to call it your Sunday go to meeting clothes. You dress up. You, you want to appear differently when you present yourself than you do in everyday life. And the children of Israel, which will come out again out of captivity and all such as had separated unto them from the filthiness of the heathen of the land to seek the Lord God of Israel did eat. They purified themselves. God gave them a horn of plenty like he had in the wilderness. It wasn't manna, but it was more than enough. And the point is simply that God will supply all of our needs according to his riches. And you know, he owns everything, the cattle on a thousand hills, all of that. And so there was plenty for every one. And the last verse reads this, and kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with joy. There's that joy again. For the Lord had made them joyful and turned the heart of the king of Assyria unto them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of the God, the God of Israel. And this feast of the unleavened bread followed the Passover. It was a seven-day feast that they did. Now, and it signifies God's deliverance, God's deliverance from whatever we've been going through, you know. So it's a good lesson because we celebrate what God has done for us. He brought the children out of exile, but we equally celebrate what he is doing. That's where the joy should come in because we're still alive. We got a measure of health. We have all of those type things. 
and we celebrate what he will do in the future. We have to tie all of that in because you can't box God in. God can do anything, anything. And so the children in today's lesson showed true faith. They showed it in their prayer life. They showed it in their work life. And they showed it in their trust that they put in God. Last thought is simple. Nothing is impossible for God. Amen. Nothing is impossible for God. When Abraham, when God told Abraham he was going to have a kid, and Abraham said, no, Lord, I'm too old. Can't do that. God asked him a simple question. Is anything too hard for God? That's the thought for the week. Nothing is impossible for God. Thank you. We bless the Lord. We come this morning in the name of our Father who art in heaven. We just bless God that we come to walk in victory. Amen. We come to recognize that we are truly going to cancel all the assignments of the enemy. And we're going to take back everything that the devil has stole. Amen. And receive everything that God has promised. So if you will, let us go to God in prayer. Almighty God, our Father, we come now. Father God, that you will speak, Lord, for your people desire and your people listen. I pray, Father God, that you would challenge us today to come up higher, to come up, Father God, where you will meet us, Father God, and that you will change the way things are going, the trajectory, Lord, that we will not be caught up in the circumstances of life because circumstances does not control God, but God controls circumstances. So, Lord, right here, right now, in this house, in this place, show up and even in the viewing and the listening audience, Father God, let there be a change in people's lives and there be a draw not unto you that you may draw nigh unto us. It's to the glory of God for the good of all. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray and all of God's people said amen. amen. At this time let us receive Reverend Thomas Stokes. He's coming with our scripture lesson, the word of God again to the people of God. Amen. Every day in the world, let it be every day in the word. Bless the Lord, all my soul and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. If you will, turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to read Ephesians chapter 1. Amen. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, 
having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in, in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. The word of God to the people of God. What a blessing in the dispensation of the fullness of time. Here it is, we are in the dispensation of grace. Thank God for God's amazing grace, amen, where God is dispensing truth. And in the dispensing of truth, amen, we learn to trust in God with all our heart. Lean not to our own understanding. Every way acknowledge him. And this is the way that we acknowledge him by giving. And this is one of the ways we worship. We show our worth to God. Everything that we have belongs to God. So we're going to ask that if you will look at the uh, screen. There's uh, Cash App. There's Zelle. There's the mailbox or send, send to the uh, church's uh, address, 3511 Wheeler Road. Let us pray. Father God, we come taking no thought for tomorrow or any hypothetical situation that might be, but Lord, we come recognizing that our lives are in your hand and that everything we have belongs to God. And Lord, we just thank you, Lord, that you have numbered our days. And Father God, we just know that you told us to teach it teach us to, to number our day so that we may apply our heart unto wisdom. Lord, we just want to do the most we can, the best we can, by every mean we can, so that the coming generation will see the footprints that we leave. It will lead them to believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And Father God, we just love you, we praise you, we thank you, and we just again thank you for all that you have done, and bless and how you have healed us, saved us, and raised us, and filled us with your Holy ghost we thank you it's to your glory for our good it's in jesus name we pray and everyone said amen amen, amen. <clears throat> and as i stand before you i would like to uh make mention of the fact that uh what we are uh, would like to share with the membership and the people of the garden grove family as well as our live stream audience uh you're welcome at garden grove you're welcome for in-person worship and you're welcome to view by way of live stream you know where God has you at this moment, but we do want you to know in-person worship, there's a ventilator, there's a, the church is being sprayed down. There also, we have the uh, social distancing. We also have uh, mask, temperature checks, and we just ask everyone that feel welcome to come, you may come. And if you feel welcome to watch live stream, you are welcome both ways. And no one is more holier or sanctified than the other. Amen. Because the, the purpose is to glorify and worship God. But I do ask that wherever you are, at the end of, thing, at the, end of the day, connect with the God in whose image you are made. Amen. We're created in the image of God. And we're somebody, amen. And I thank God for that, amen. And I will not let the devil, amen, try to beat me down or make me feel any less, amen. We're going to take back everything the devil has tried to steal, amen. We bless God. At this moment, we're going to ask that uh, Reverend Peterson will come and say a word about our speaker, and then we will have a selection. And the next voice you hear will be that of our, the man of the hour, Reverend Peterson will give his name and all his other credentials that he wants to give when he comes. Reverend Peterson, if you will come. Good morning, Ghana Grove. Good, morning. Good to see everyone. I have the distinct pleasure this morning to introduce the speaker of, the, of today, our very own Reverend Ledger Bowman. He's a true man of God. He's a great, great family man. 
He loves uh, people. He's a very user-friendly uh, type guy. Um, and I want you to give him your words of amen uh, when uh, he's up here. Because if you ever appear, um, you will also like the same. And uh, without any further ado, um, the next um, thing we hear is a musical selection. It was early one morning, just about the break of day. Jesus came in my room and he touched me. He washed all my sins away. Good morning, church family. Again, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Praise God this morning for his awesome work. Amen. And all his many blessings he has bestowed upon us this morning. This morning, I would like for us to even just show how much we love God this morning. Amen. And just lift up our voices and just give him some praise. Father God, and just thank him for being the almighty God that he is in our life. Amen. For he has brought us a mighty long way this morning. Amen. 
is he woke us up this morning when he didn't even have to. And that is truly a blessing in itself. Amen. Praise God this morning. The devil is mad because God is on the throne. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to his name. He's worthy to be praised. Amen. I love that. Amen. That just shows we got life in us this morning. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, again, I'd just like to welcome everyone this morning to the Garden of Grove Baptist Church morning service. Amen. And though those, all those who found it not robbery to tune in this morning on our live broadcast this morning. Amen. Praise God this morning. While well, our pastor of this house, Reverend Dr. Rufus Copeland. Amen. Amen. And his lovely wife, the First Lady, Sarah Copeland. Amen. Praise God for, for him and his wife. We're glad to have him back after he went out and got him some much-needed rest. Amen. Because you know he stays on the battlefield. Amen. I'm talking about day and night. Praise God for the man of God of this house. I'd like to thank all the the, the, the deacons this morning, amen, for the work that they do, and, and my brothers in, in Christ, uh, Reverend Thomas Stokes and Reverend Peterson, and also uh, Reverend Russ, who's uh, not here this morning, amen, but we just want to lift him up in prayer and keep him lifted up in prayer this morning, Father, uh, amen? amen, and thank God for all our lovely wives, amen, yeah. who keep us in line. Amen. Sister Copeland over there giggling, but she knows just what I'm talking about. Amen. Praise God. And I just want to thank God for my lovely wife. Amen. She is truly a blessing. All these many years, we're still in love. Amen. Ain't that right, honey? Yes, sir. Praise God. I had to get a second opinion on that. You know what I mean? <laughs> Amen. But she shook her head like, yeah, you know. So we all good. Amen. Amen. Praise God this morning. But we have a word from the Lord this morning. Amen. And we can't forget our, mini our media ministry. Amen. Who does such an excellent job. Who bringing this broadcast live over all this time. Amen. And allowing God to use them for the excellent talents that he has blessed them with. Amen. See, everybody can't do that. Everybody don't want to get up early in the morning and stay late at night and set this whole program in motion. And Amen? That's a commitment. Amen. For the Lord. Praise God. But let us go to the throne of grace this morning. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come before you at this hour just lifting up your name and thanking you for this opportunity, Father God, to preach your word this morning. So we ask, Lord, that the Spirit of God move and have his way in this place. We ask that you give us ears to hear, Father God. But more than just hearing your word, Father God, give us a receiving heart that it may manifest within our lives, Father God. It will saturate our hearts, Father God, that we will no longer be the same, Father God, that we will be changed at a twinkling of an eye, Father so we thank you for this opportunity, and as I decrease and you increase, Father God, we ask that you just use me in a mighty way this morning. Remove all fear and doubt, Father God, and let your word come forth, Father God, in your son Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to his name this morning. Praise God. You know, you know we all love a lot of things in this world, Amen. We, you know, we, we, we love our, our spouses, we, we love our wives, we love our, our homes, and some of us even love our jobs, amen? Praise God. But this morning, and I just asked, how many of you men here this morning would be content to be married to a wife who faithfully cooked your meals, did your laundry, cleaned your house, but fell out of love with you? And wives, would you be content to be Married to a man who provided you with nice things, nice things, and worked faithfully and provided for the house and rubbed your feet occasionally, but was not in love with you. See, that foot rub wouldn't be the same without that love, amen? 
Do you remember the first time you fell in love and how excited you were? And in just in case there's someone who has never fell in love, what about those highlights of your life? The time you accomplished something that you didn't think you could do or, or think about back in the day when you really had it going on and that special guy who had his eye on you and whatever it was in those moments in your life, when you just think about it, doesn't it bring a smile to your face? Amen? See, we put a lot of emphasis on the things in this world. We love a lot of things in this world. See, but my question for you this morning is Jesus, is Jesus your first love? Is Jesus your first love? See, the scripture tells about God's love for us. But what about our love for God? Do we put him first in our lives? Do we love him fully as we ought to? But before you answer the question, in your mind, just think for a minute. Do I put him first in my decision making, my giving, my time? Is Jesus your first love? Is Jesus your first love? Turn your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Amen? All right. The book of Revelation, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. And the word of God reads, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write these things, says he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He said, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not hear bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Oh, mercy, Lord. Oh, mercy, Lord. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto you quickly, and I will remove thy candlesticks out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, thou hast but this how has that thou hast the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. And to him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. The reading of God's words this morning. Amen. Return to your first love. See, in this text, we find John, one of the disciples of Jesus, is in prison in the island of Patmos. It's, it's an exile island where those who were martyrs and those who were down for Christ was placed there. He is there serving and he's worshiping God, and, but he was also promised that he would see the return of Jesus. See, a lot of theologians believe in this prophetic vision, which while he is in prison, he is seeing the return of Jesus. And he's given a, a vision, a, a revelation of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, John, he sees his glory and falls at his feet. And, and then Christ puts his hand on John and says, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead. And behold, I am alive forever and ever. Amen. Amen. See, this is what's happening. Jesus is showing up in this vision to John. And these lamps, these lamp stands, they represent these churches. And they are churches that are on the earth at this time. They're, they are powerful and they're moving, they're working, doing all these wonderful things for Christ. And John is writing to the church of Ephesus. And Ephesus was a world-known city. It was mighty and, and majestic. And it was a center of tourism and, and trade. It was wealthy and a famous city, and one of the ancient wonders of the world was there, the, the pagan temple of Artemis. And see, it was a great city. It had great culture and religion. It was prosperous. And the church of Ephesus was a marvelous church, privileged and blessed every way. Every way. 
But the church of Ephesus was planted by the Apostle Paul. And it began with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And they understood who they were in Christ and how to engage in spiritual warfare. Their problem was not the failure to understand good doctrine. Their problem was not that they lacked perseverance. See, the church existed during one of the most difficult times in all of Christian history. The Ephesian church had refused to bow the need to Caesar and had stood firm in the midst of persecution. So you have this church moving in power. And I mean, things are happening. Amen? They're busybodies. Their calendar was full. Studying the word and, and praying and helping those in need. They're calling out people who are fake and phony. And Jesus says, yes. Yes, you're doing all these great things and, and the Lord commends them. See, nothing goes unnoticed by God. He knows all that we do. But there's a powerful insight to be learned here. See, our works are not enough to please the Lord. He wants more than our outward, our outward compliance. What Jesus wants is our love. Amen? But see, he makes this transition in, in, in verse 4, and he says, but there is one thing you're missing here. You're not in love with me anymore. You have lost your first love. So you're doing all these exciting and, and awesome things and people know who you are. And this is the same church that Timothy pastored. And Jesus said, you're working and doing great things. But if you do not stop just doing the works and if you don't start having this love fest, this love relationship with me, then I will remove your lampstand. And what he is saying here, I'm going to remove my power and presence from your life, from this church. And yes, you will be a shell. A gathering of people, a building with lights in it, but the presence of God will no longer reside there because you have fallen out of love with me. And see, they had started out strong, but over time, things had begun to change. A generation had come and gone. And since Paul had preached to them, they had remained faithfully to the word of God and had endured hardship, but something was lacking. Something was lacking. They had lost their passion. The passionate love that had motivated them and burned them within their hearts. They had given it away to a mechanical orthodox, a, real, a realistic form of service that lacked enthusiasm and zeal. Jesus said, I don't desire this. I don't desire for you to be out of love. See, I don't desire just works and good deeds. I desire communion. I desire a relationship with you. I de desire worship. And if you do these things, our love relationship will come back intact. Amen? But you have to return to your first love. See, I believe this word was not just for the church of Ephesus, but also for our personal lives and for Garden Grove as a whole. I believe where we're at at this day and time, God is not just about restoring our vertical love for him, but God is also about restoring our horizontal love that we have because if we can get this relationship right, then God will be able to bring order in all these other relationships. But it starts right here, amen? And see, this is one of these mornings where you have to really be honest with yourself. See, so you have to show up, just you and God, or sitting at the table, sitting at that seat next to you, amen, having a conversation, and, and he says, that, I love what you've done, but I need you to return unto me. I need a little more, amen? And this was a strong, there used to be a song that came out by Roberta Flack and Donny Hathaway in 1971, amen? You lost that love feeling. You lost that love feeling, I'm just saying here this morning. How does this happen? See, because God said we're supposed to move from faith to faith and glory to glory. And you're supposed to move to a fresh understanding of God and a more loving relationship with him. And you would know more about God and to begin to be more about his business. Amen. See, but I believe if we will return to our first love, I believe God will bring a fresh excitement, a fresh anointing, a fresh 
passion, a fresh desire, a fresh motivation, a burning desire so that we could accomplish the things he had called us to do. And it all comes out of love. Amen. And Jesus comes to the church of Ephesus and he says, I want you to return to your first love. So what was Jesus saying as a church, as individuals, it shows that you can leave your first love. Amen. But let's define your first love in Matthews. See, we are God's first love. See, because in John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. See, that's love. And then God has shown us his love by, by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to be crucified on the cross for your sins and, and my sins and the whole world's sins. He, he was beaten and, and he was whipped and he was spit on and he was humiliated. And then they nailed him to the cross with seven inch nails in and, and his wrists and his ankles and, and blood just ran all down his face and, and his body and as they watched him die. Jesus suffered and died for us, bearing our sins on Calvary's cross. Not because he was forced to be because of his love for us and his desire to bring us into a relationship with the Father. See, Jesus has never lost his passion for us. His love for us, his desire for us is as strong as today as it was when he first created us. See, he hung there on the cross and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Amen. All right. And for what? For what? So that you and I can be released, released from the punishment that we deserve so that we may have peace, enjoy the goodness of the land and, and live forever with them. Amen. Yeah. See, that's love. See, God is fully devoted and committed to us, and the Bible tells me that his love is unfailing. But in Matthews 22 and 37, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And then 38 said, this is the first, the first and great commandment. The first commandment is to love thy God with all thy heart. But instead, we become infatuated with knowledge instead of holiness personal holiness is no longer our quest we become convinced that knowledge is what makes us holy something that we can attain for ourselves replaces God presence and lordship in our life and I'm just saying here this morning amen but there are many similarities between having a good marriage and a good relationship with your spouse and having a good relationship with God because see, in the Bible, there's a lot of language that refers to marriage in describing a personal relationship with God. Those who receive and profess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior are referred to as the bride of Christ. And in Jeremiah 2 and 2, God says, I remember the devotion of your youth when you first got saved. How many can remember when they first got saved, how excited they was to be in love with God? Amen. How is a bride, a newborn Christian, he said, you love me and, and you follow me through the desert. See, it's like a man and a woman committed to each other, walking down the aisles, holding hands on one accord, loving each other, standing before the man of God in holy matrimony and, and speaking the vows to one another, which is comparison to the covenant that we have made with God who has called us into his fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ. And as they stand next to each other and, and the preacher asks, will you two love and honor each other and comfort each other in, in sickness and death and in health as, as long as you both shall live? And they both say, yes, yes, we will. And then as we become the bride of Christ and we walk down the same aisle, confessing our mouth that we are sinners and we believe in our heart that God was raised him from the dead and everybody is happy and, and excited and the angels 
are dancing in heaven because we've been adopted into the kingdom of God. And we just made a covenant with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who said he would never leave us or forsake us. And he would love us all the days of our lives. Amen. See, a lot of people end up getting disappointed in life because their marriage ultimately never measures up to those childhood fantasies and romantic dreams that we have. Amen. Right, See, this is exactly why we have so many broken homes end up in, bro in broken divorces. Somehow, reality, they, they never measures up to one's expectations. But I challenge you this morning, right now today, to begin fantasizing about the love relationship that will never, ever disappoint you. And it's a love relationship with Jesus. Is there anyone here this morning that God has delivered you from something? See, he took your hand and he guided you through some dark places, some narrow and bumpy roads. He healed some of your sickness. He dried up some tears. He kicked down some doors and he opened up some windows and he poured out some blessings. Amen? Amen. Amen. See, God said you shall have no other gods before me. You should not bow down to them or, or serve them or, or worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. And he wants to be fully devoted. And he wants us to be fully devoted and, and faithful to him and to love him as he loves us. And see, the word devoted means to latch on and refuse to let go. He wants to have a close and intimate relationship with us. And see, if your love for God is right, I say, if your love for God is right, everything else will be right. See, your love for Christ will give you strength to love that unlovable person or that person you just don't like. That love for Christ will cause you to treat your spouse right. The love of Christ enables you to become a giver. The love of Christ will cause you to forgive those who have wronged you. See, the love of Christ will allow you to live a righteous life. See, loving God, you can't go wrong. Amen? Right, yeah. Loving God will bring you joy in the midst of chaos. Yeah. No matter how much the world changes, God's love for us never changes. See, like a marriage between a man and a woman, the two are devoted and faithful and love one another because of their love for Jesus. There are certain things that we don't do to each other. Amen. They respect each other. They have a good foundation. They can stand against the temptations of the devil. They can stand when the storms and the obstacles of life appear. See, loving one another proves that we love God. We know we love God because we do not hate our brothers or our sisters. If we love God, it is impossible to dislike or have bad feelings toward our brothers and sisters. And we are brothers and sisters in Christ, whether you like it or not. The Bible says, if a man say, I love God and hate his brother, he is a liar. For he that loves not his brother who he has seen, how can he love God who he has not seen? We are to care for one another if we love God. And loving one another is the way we can tell if we are saved. See, because the Bible says if we dwell in love, then we dwell in God and God in us. For the Bible tells me that God is love. Then we are demonstrating the nature of God. And if, and if we are not loving one another, then we are demonstrating that we do not have the nature of God. Amen. Then just maybe we're not saved, no matter what we claim. See, because in 1 John 2 and 15, it says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If a man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the, the, the lust of the flesh and the, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Amen? But see, in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 6, beginning at verse 4, it says, hear, O Israel. We're going to put Gardner Grove here this morning. Amen. Here on Gardner Grove. The Lord our God is one Lord. 
and there is no other. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all our might. He shall be your first love. See, nothing should come before him. It may sound harsh, but not even your loved ones should come before God. Amen? And then it says in verse 6, it says, And these words which I command thee this day, talking about us, amen, shall be in thy heart, because not putting Jesus first in our lives is a sin, whether you believe it or not. Amen. Teach your children to love the Lord by obeying him. Talk to them whether you're at home or traveling in the morning or evening. Make sure that they put Jesus first in their life. Do whatever you need to do, but don't forget what the Lord has said, amen? If you have to write him on the back of your hands or, or your forehead, on your doors, on your bathroom mirrors, don't forget to put Jesus first, amen? Because he will bring you into the land of promise that he promised your father's his father, your fathers, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and he will open up the windows of heaven and, and pour out blessings, out his blessings on you. He will keep you in his bosom. See, the Lord will keep you from evil. The Lord will keep you going out and coming in. Amen? Even your houses and your children's houses will be full of good things. See, don't get caught up worshiping the things of the world, for your God is a jealous God, see? And don't test him. Experience the love that the world has never known and cannot give you. I promise you, the world cannot give you the same kind of love that our Lord and Savior can. Amen? Because the Lord, the world is not going to die for you. And if you are really in love with Jesus and have this real vibrant burning for the Lord Jesus Christ, you will make him first in your life. See, the people of Israel, for the most part, was devoted, and they were faithful to God. Yes, at times they did slip away from God, sometimes murmuring and, and complaining and committing acts of wickedness. See, the Bible said that we have all sinned and fell short of the glory of God. See, but they quickly confessed, and then they repented of their sins, turning back to the Lord. Their backsliding, they never lasted long, and they, and they didn't deliberately or recklessly try to corrupt the way of righteousness of God himself. They did not slap God in his face and deliberately sinning in his presence. We have all heard the saying, oh, God knows my heart. Yeah, he do. Yeah, he do. He knows your heart. He knows everything. And in Matthew 15 and 8, it says, Jesus, he said, Jesus says, these people, they honor me with their lips. They sing songs and come to church, but their hearts are far from me. Does anyone here need a change in their heart? A change in their living? A change in their thinking? Well, repent before God. Because First Peter 2 and 9 says that we, we, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, Israel was holy and, and stood apart to be God's pure and, and righteous people, and they were God's bride who loved him and followed him wherever he led them. But in time, the people strayed from God's breaking their marriage vows and commitments to him, turning away from their first love. See, they followed deceptive and worthless idols. They started committing all types of sins. Have we, as God's people, broken our vows? Have we forsaken our first love? Have we turned our backs on God, the one who delivered us from the pits of hell, who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for you and I, just like Israel? See, the Bible says in Jeremiah 2 and 13, we have committed two sins against our God like an unfaithful woman to her husband. We have strayed off committing spiritual adultery, separating 
ourselves from him and turning to the world for our pleasures and disregarding his word and his commandments and seeking after our own desires and our own will and leaning to our own understanding and not trusting in the word of God. Leaving to please self instead of pleasing God. We're living a lifestyle where our opinions and our traditions mean more to us than the word of God. And sin is corrupting our homes and our, our churches. And instead of strong homes, we have strong gangs. Divorce rate is off the chart. Sons and daughters plagued by sexual immoralities, killing and selfishness. Our government is in an economic recession and people are depressed and struggling to make ends meet. And there is no justice in the world. And our government has become crooked and evil. The Bible says even the earth groans and moans for God's people to return to their first love. But the good thing about the God we're married to is he merciful and his love is everlasting. Because John 3, 14, it says God, he, he, he speaks to his people after they had left him. And he says, return, O oh, faithless people, for I am your husband, your God. Repent and make me first love. See, Christ never acts for part of our lives. He acts for all of it. He never acts for a place in our heart. He acts for absolute rule and reign in our hearts. He never acts to be one of many passions. He acts to be the consuming passion of our lives. But as I come to a close, if they don't repent, if they don't return to their first love. The Bible says he will remove his spirit of the mess. Or oh, you may still have your buildings. You may still have your programs. Your busy scheduling all the externals. You may still be able to attract people with pretty facilities. But the power of God will be missing. See, because the Bible says God will take his hand off the church and leave us to just go through the motions. But I want you to see there's a tragic picture that he's painted here for us. A group of people going through the motions of Christianity without the living in the midst. Could there be anything more sad or empty? Because the Bible says this morning, he who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. But the truth of the matter is that a church is made up of individuals. The passion of the church would never be greater than the passion of the members. See, if we are on fire for Christ, then passion will be reflected in our church. God is good. Can we close our eyes and for a minute? Can we close our eyes and put our focus on Jesus? Can we fall in love with Jesus? Close your eyes. Close your eyes and feel his presence, his love and mercy. Fall in love with Jesus. Repent this morning and make him first in your life. See, God wants you and me to go back and remember that moment in time. And having that in our memory, he wants us to return. He wants us to come back to him, to come back to our first love. See, to the place and the time on our life to where he was everything to us. That's where he wants us this morning. For he gave his life that we may have life. I ain't talking about just life. I'm talking about life more abundantly. Oh, how I love Jesus. Give God some praise this morning. Amen.
Right now, the world is in a bad situation. And the Bible tells us that we are the salt of the world. And if the world is in a bad situation, see, because God gives his people power. Evidently, something is missing. It ain't God. It's not God. So God says, come back to me. Remember your first love. He has a plan for each individual here this morning. And as my pastor come back up, open your hearts and give it to Jesus. Give God some praise this morning. Amen. What a blessing. Amen. I take my mask off as a symbol that you can't muzzle the truth of the word of God. Amen. The man said, oh, how I love Jesus. It's because he first loved me. Amen. Is Jesus your first love? If he is, put him first. Amen. If he's your first love, put him first. Amen. Put Jesus first. I was we had this thing about uh, my job had a slogan. We were to put it first, last, and always. I'm glad uh, I don't work there anymore. <laughs> we, why don't we put, put God first, last, and always, amen. Amen. God should be our everything. I just say this, and I want to say, if you're out there, and if you have come to a point in life, and we can all get there. It's, it's hopeless. If you get a, at a point where you're hopeless, we're giving you hope. Amen. And I'm gi giving you hope, and there's no, other, no greater hope than the love of God. And oh, how we love him because he first loved us. And God has a, the highest love, which is agape, is unconditional. It's in spite of, not because of. It didn't see anything good in me, but he saved me anyhow. That was nothing good in you that made God save you. God saved you, amen, because God so loved the world. And that's the love of God, amen. And we should have that love one toward another, amen. Not because of, not because you cook, not because you clean, amen. I just love you in spite of. Not because of everything you don't do, and I thank God for my wife loving me, amen, because there are some in spite ofs. And there's some in spite ofs in you, in spite of some things you don't do, amen, but there are some people that love you, amen. If you're out there, I just want you to know, Christ Jesus came, came to his own. His own received him not. But if you're out there, to them that received him, to them this day he gives eternal life, simply to those who believe on his name. God bless you, Jesus. Keep you. Thank God again for the man of God, for the word of God. Love is what love does. Amen. And we show our love for one another by what we do. Amen. And we show our love for God by how we treat one another. Amen. Because how can we say we love him, but we don't love each other? Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for being in the house of God this moment, this moment, and this day. Father God, we have heard from heaven, and the word was not muzzled. The word was plain. God, you do not have a speed impediment, and you do not have a hearing problem. So, Lord, we thank you that you hear our cry, and we thank you that you proclaim truth through your vessels that humble themselves before you. Now, Lord, let this word fall on good ground, and let the people respond by being just joyful strong Christian that will carry and challenge the truth in the lives of others we now look to God who is able to keep us from falling present us faultless one day before his kingdom with exceeding with extreme and exceeding joy we look now to him who is the Lord our Savior Jesus Christ be you now both now henceforth and forever keep us in your everlasting care and the church of God said amen The GGBC family would like to thank you for tuning in to today's broadcast. 
We hope you enjoyed today's service and received a word of encouragement to help strengthen you along your Christian walk. Our services are recorded live every Sunday morning at 11 o'clock a.m. via Facebook Live and available on our YouTube channel. The building remains open with limited seating available for Sunday morning worship. On behalf of our pastor, First Lady, and the entire Gardner Grove Baptist Church family, it is our prayer that you experience the love of God in this fellowship. May his abundant grace and peace continue to keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. See you next week.